apple. So they have some of the properties of an apple, but they are simplifications of the apple. Even though if you look at this, probably you see it's not an apple, okay? You see, this is also a painting of an apple, a very realistic painting of the, of the apple, but even though it's a painting of the apple, it doesn't possess all the characteristics of the apple. It doesn't possess the smell, it doesn't possess the taste, doesn't possess the seeds. So there are many things in an apple, in a real apple, we don't have here in this model of an apple. Okay? So uh, like this kind of models, the, the, the mathematical models we are talking in this workshop, they are also representations of the real world. And you must not forget this. This is not the real world. The model is a representation with some characteristics of the real world, but even though a simplification of the real process. Okay? So a possible definition of a model is an abstracted representation of a complex real world system. Okay? So firstly, it's a simplification of the reality. And because it is the simplification, it doesn't behave exactly as the reality. And we must be prepared for that when we use models. We must be prepared for the errors the models possess. So we try the models to have the less error possible, but we must be prepared and be conscient the model will always have an error. Okay, we must control it, we must be able to quantify it, but it always have an error. And why modeling? Why do we use modeling? We can use models for many different purposes. If you want to systematize the use of the model, you can think about an equation like this. So if you have uh, input data and we call it U and we have an operator which we call model that transforms this input data into outputs. Okay, so this is a generic description of a model. And it can be used in many different ways. For example, if you know the inputs and you already defined the model and you use the model to transform these inputs into outputs, okay, this is the traditional way of using a model. It's used for simulation, it's used for prediction, and also to, to understand the systems, okay? So this is the traditional way of using the model. But you can also know the inputs and the outputs, but you don't know how to relate them, okay? So in this case, the problem is you know U and Y, but you don't know the model. So the the, the, the type of model, the, the definition of the model. So this kind of problem is called system identification. Okay? Usually this is done prior to be able to do simulation. And also you can think about problems where you know the model and you know the outputs, but you want to know the inputs that will produce those outputs, okay? For example, if the outputs are a certain level of pollution in a coastal area, and what you want is to define the inputs that will produce that level of pollution, that maximum level of pollution, okay? So this is what we call the inverse problem. And usually it's used when we do management, when we do decision-making, we want to know how much are the inputs that will produce a certain state in the system that we know in advance. So these are different ways of using models. Okay, so again, what is a model? And a model is a representation of reality, like these guys over here. So these guys are also models. They are representations of the reality of of real people, but they are not real. When they wake up in the morning, they don't look like this. So they are models, okay? Obviously, we are talking about 
this kind of models. We are talking about mathematical models. And there are many similarities between the two, but there is one thing that is quite different between them, is that unlike the other models, mathematical models improve with age. Okay, so I can prove you this right now, you see? Definitely these guys didn't improve with age. But mathematical models, they do improve in, with age if they are used and tested and certified. In that case, they, they, they improve with age. Okay, so never trust a model that is a brand new model, just create it and uh, never test it. Okay, so a model should improve, should be updated, but it must pass the test of, of times. Okay, um, so I will briefly distinguish between two different kinds of models, okay? Between data-driven models and uh, deterministic models. In data-driven models, we don't know, or at least we don't want to use process equations, okay? So sometimes we don't, don't even know the process equations. And in other times, we know the process equations, but we don't want to use the process equations. Um, for example, if in the model, if we are, if we are uh, describing human behavior, we don't know the equations for human behavior. So we must rely on data to, to, to describe the, the process. In other, in other cases, we know the, the equations, but we want to use data-driven models, okay? In those data-driven models, data can come from different sources in high volume and high variety. So it's the big data paradigm, okay? And we must heavily manage uh, this kind of data, okay? So we also need historical data to train the model. So the model will be trained using data and then we, we need input data to, to drive the model, okay? So the model depends heavily on statistics to assess model results. And after training, usually it is faster than deterministic models. On the other hand, deterministic models are models where we know and we want to use the process equations, okay? In that case, uh, most of the time, we need to simplify the equations that we want to use, okay? It is a complex equation-dependent solution. Again, we need data to, to run the model, but data sources, don't have the same data variety as, uh, as uh, data-driven models. And historical data is also needed, but in this case, to calibrate the model. Usually, after calibration and validation, these kind of models give a better prediction capability when we know the process. And also, they usually are, are slower than data-driven models. So when we talk about data in oceanographic models, we, we are talking about data like this. So the kind of data that we, we, we use with, with our model. So I, I thank Sosib by this picture. So you can see here that we have many different kinds of data. We have remote sensing data, for example, for sea surface temperature, for bathymetries, we have fixed moors, we have oceanographic cruises with different kinds of data, we have autonomous vehicles, we have remote operated vehicles, we have uh, drifting buoys, many different kinds of data that we must integrate and assimilate in our models. Okay, so this is the kind of data that we are talking about when we talk about models. Also, 
uh, we need to integrate that data to create global models. But in many cases, those global models don't have the, the resolution to be able to, to give answer to uh, problems in, in the society. So there is many times the need to do what is called downscaling. And the process of downscaling is to gather not only data, but also global model results and include them into regional and local models with high resolution that can produce the kind of services that are useful to the society. Usually what is done is that this part of the equation of the problem is dealt by institutions or universities and this part of the problem should be dealt by companies, IT companies and uh, institutions like that. Okay. Sometimes it's not the, the case, but in many cases, it's what we search for. That's why I try to include also IT professionals in, in, this, in this workshop. Okay, so I was referring, I was referring the, the equations, okay? I, I'm trying to delete, yes, some people was, okay. <laughs> uh, so I was referring the equations. So basically this uh, equation model it solves directly the equations and which type of equations. So if it's a, a hydrodynamic model, what we want to compute is the velocity, right? Well, if it was a solid, if you were talking about the solid, the equation we should solve would be a very easy equation. It would be the, the Newton law that we all know from high school. So basically, if we know the force and we know the mass, we can compute the acceleration and with the acceleration we can compute the velocity. So, and it's very easy because it's a single vector for the force and a single vector for the acceleration. Even if we have more than one force, we can compute the, the resultant of the forces and we apply it to the center of mass of the solid and we have a single force. Okay, so it's very easy with the solid. But if it is a fluid, for example, if it is a liquid, like what we have in the ocean, okay? Again, we also have force equals ma. But the difficulty here is that the force changes from point to point, okay? So every point has a different value for the source and also changes with time. And also the, the, the acceleration will change with position and will change with time. So it's also uh, still an equation, but it's, this is a field, okay? The force is a field. It's something that change continuously in space and time. But even though the equation says exactly the same, okay? So I, I don't want to scare you with this, but the, the final equations are something like this, okay? So they look very, very complicated, but in fact, this is acceleration in the, each of the directions, and these are the different forces acting in the ocean, okay? I, do, I will not get into details, so, but this is Newton law, and for the case of a liquid, it's called the Navier-Stokes equations, okay? These equations are well known for a very long time, since the 19th century. The big problem with this is that no one knows how to solve them. Okay, so there is, in fact, a $1 million prize for the first mathematician that managed to solve this equation. In fact, the, he don't need to solve the equation. He only needs to prove some properties about the solution of the equation. So if he, the first one to manage to do this, will get the $1 million prize. So, but we don't know how to solve them, but we need to be able to solve them. So what we do is we use models. So we transform these equations into other type of equations that are easy to solve. 
And basically what we do is this. So we have the equations that are continuous in space and time, okay? So the properties change continuously in space and continuously in time. And we simplify the equations into some equations that we know how to solve. So basically what we do is discretize the equation. And th this means that we will change to equations that are applied to certain points in space, okay? So if we apply the equations, the simplified equations to each point in space, we get a system of linear equations. And we know how to solve this. In high school, we know how to solve at least a three by three system of equations. Obviously, because in this case, each equation is the value gives the value of the property for a single point. As many equations we have, the better we discretize and we solve our problem. So we don't want to solve a tree by tree system of equations. We want to solve millions of equations at the same time. Okay, so we must define millions of points. And in those millions of points, we want to solve those million equations simultaneously into a system. Okay, so this is what we do using computers. Computers are quite good to solve this kind of problems. Okay, so this is called discretization. So we discretize this into certain points in space. So we must define the points in space. Okay, so we must create a grid, a computational grid. And there are many ways of creating a computational grid. So we can we can start use a grid like this, a geographic Cartesian grid. So it's Cartesian in the coordinates, uh, latitude, longitude, okay? And we have different cells and we compute one equation for each of these cells. And simultaneously, we compute all the equations at the same time, you see? So this is done here, but sometimes if the system is small, Instead of a geographic coordinate, we may think on using a Cartesian coordinate, a projected coordinate, okay? In that case, each, each cell is, is a square or a rectangle. But you see, there are many cells here where we must apply the equations because the grid is like, like this. But there are, those are places where we already know the result, the velocity here is zero because this is land, okay? Even though, because of the grid, we need to solve the equations here and we are wasting com computational time. So there are other possibilities for grids. We can use curvilinear grids like this, you see? If we use a curvilinear grid, we don't have cells over land. We just have cells inside the water. And so this is, more flexible and, and more efficient to use than the other grid. And even though we don't have enough control over the size of the cells. So we can think about a grid like this, a triangular grid. And in this case, we have a very good control on the size. So we can have very small cells in the areas of interest and very large cells in the rest of the domain. So this is also a possibility. I will not enter into details of uh, um, advantage and disadvantage of each one of these grids. So different models, different methods use different grids. I will not get into details on that, but each one has advantage and disadvantage. In the, if the model is a 3D model, we also need to, to define the geometry, the grid, in the vertical direction. So we can think about a Cartesian grid in the vertical direction. Okay, so a grid like this. Okay, if we use a grid like this, you see that in the deep ocean, we have a very large number of layers of cells. But when you move into shallow water, you start decreasing the number of cells. So this is good in deep ocean, but it's not the perfect discretization for uh, shallow waters. So you, we may think about 
a different kind of grid. For example, this kind of grid where we have the same number of cells in the deep ocean than we have in the shallow water, you see? In this case, we don't lose resolution in the shallow water. This is the called sigma grid or terrain following grid. But this grid also have the medical problems, especially in areas where the, the, the layers are tilted, it introduces some medical problems. So we can think about using either this or this and uh, modern and advanced models, they also manage to do something like this, generic vertical meshes where we can define different kinds of meshes for different positions in, in, in the domain. Okay, so these are many possibilities for grids. Okay, so I told you we need to discretize the space. So we created cells, but discretizing the space is not only about creating the cells. It's the, the nature of the space itself also changes. So what I mean is that in a continuous medium, the value of the properties change continues along the space, you see? In a discretized space, the value of the property is constant inside each of the cells. And there is no smooth change of the properties along the space. Basically, the property is always the same here. And then suddenly, across the boundary, it changes to a new value, you see? So there is no continuous change. It's discretized, OK? And besides discretizing the space, we also need to discretize the time. So the time, which is something that we are used to think as a continuous, in the model, it is not continuous. The time is also uh, discretized. So it means that we either talk about time i or time i plus one, but we don't have nothing in between. So the model computes the values of the properties here, and then it jumps to this time and it computes the properties here in this time. Okay, so we have a certain time step and we don't have nothing between these two instants of time. Okay, so this is the discretization of the time. When we use this and we start solving the equations, there are different possibilities. One possibility is what is called the explicit method. And in the explicit method, what we do is when we compute the, the value of the property in the new time, we use the values of the neighbors in the old time, you see? So, and because in the new time, we already know the values of the neighbors, this is a very simple equation to solve. It is explicit. We don't need any system of equations to solve this. Okay, so this is the most simple way of doing it. But we are doing a mistake here. We are doing an error because we, are, we should be using, in this time, we should be using the values of the neighbors in the same new time. Okay, so we have an error and this error is big when the delta t is large and it's small when the delta t is small. Okay, so it depends on the time step. If the time step is small, we are not making a, a big error because this is not so different from this. But if the time step is large, we are doing a big error. So usually in explicit methods, the time step is limited to very small values. Okay, so, but there is the possibility of doing the implicit method. In the implicit method, the value of the property in the new time is computed as a function of the value of the neighbors also in the new time. But because when we compute this, we don't know this. And when we compute this, we don't know this. We must solve for all the points at the same time. So we must solve a system of equations, which is something that takes much more time to solve. We, we need to solve it 
with a method that takes a lot of time to do it. Okay, so each iteration takes a lot of time to be solved. But the good, the good thing is that because now we are not committing this error, this error that we were doing here, the time step can be larger. Okay, so basically in this case, we have fewer iterations, but each iteration takes a lot of time. And in this case, we have many iterations, but each iteration is faster. So this is a balance, a balance between number of iterations and the, the time that each iteration takes to, to be computed. Okay? Well, there is also a third alternative, which is the semi-implicit method. In the semi-implicit method, what we do is we compute the new property in the new time function of the neighbors, some of the neighbors in the new time and other neighbors in the old time, okay? So at the, at the first glance, this seems a little bit awkward because I mean, if we are solving this and at least some of the neighbors are also in the new time, we still need to solve a system of equations, okay? But the thing is, if we define carefully which neighbors are in the old time and which neighbors are in the new time, if we do it carefully, we end up with a system of equations that is very easy and very fast to solve, okay? And even though this is almost an implicit method, it's not exactly implicit, but it's almost implicit. So it means that we can have large time steps and at the same time, each iteration is faster than in a true implicit method. Okay, so these are the different possibilities to, to solve the model. And when you, we talk about models and analyze models, you must be aware of the type of model that you are using, okay? So, and I told you that is, except in the implicit method, in all the other methods, there is a limitation on the size of the delta t. So you must wonder what happens if we increase the delta t. So if there is a limitation, there must be a drawback of increasing the delta t. Otherwise we would do it. So what happens? So I prepared here a very simple example to show you what happened. Uh, in this example, this is a tide stream. So this is a bar in a tidal area. And this is a flood. Okay, and I have here the velocity, the, the time series of velocity with time in a point somewhere here. Okay, so you, you see that a long time, the velocity increases during flood, then decreases, then increases during gap, then decreases and again. So this is the evolution. And this evolution was computed using a very low delta t, okay? so. Very low delta t means that the execution time is high because to, to progress a certain period, you must do many iterations because the delta t is small between each iteration. Okay, so we, we would like to increase the delta t so the model would run fast. Okay, so if we try to do it with a larger delta t, so to decrease the execution time, what will happen? It will happen like this. So the time series behaves a little bit strange. You see here some oscillation, and then again, a little bit different from the other solution, but then suddenly it starts going crazy. So it starts instabilizing, you see? So this phenomena is called instabilization. And if you look at the velocity map, it is completely wrong. So what is produced by this simulation is completely wrong. Okay, so it didn't crash. Sometimes the model crashes. In this case, I tried not to crash the model to show you what would happen before the model crashes. Okay, and this was because 
I increase the delta t more than I should. So the question is, how much should I increase the delta t? In, in fact, what we are discussing should not be the delta t. We should be discussing a number, a non-dimensional number called Kura. And Kura, if you see, is the ratio between velocity times delta t divided by the space, the, the size of the cells. Okay? And you see that in one delta t, so this velocity is the velocity of propagation of the faster uh, property. Uh, so if we multiply the velocity by delta t, we get the space, the, the, the distance moved in one delta t. Okay? And we compare it with the delta x. And when the distance moved in one delta t is much larger than the delta x, then we start having problems. Okay, so what we must control is the Kura number. So for explicit models, usually the Kura number must be smaller than one. And for implicit models, they, it can be higher than one, but if it's a semi-implicit model, it also has some limitation that can be a higher number, but uh, we must be able to, to, it depends on the model, but we must be careful about using high current numbers, okay? So this is instability. It's one of the problems that may arise in models. And I would like to show you another different problem that has nothing to do with this. And for that, I will use a different example. So an example connected with diffusion. So what I'm showing here is a conceptual example. So think about the channel, a 1D example. So it's a 1D model. It's like a channel or a stretch of a river. So where you have, imagine that you have that river and that you have a distribution of pollution in the river like this. Okay. So in the initial, in time zero, the distribution of pollution is that the river is clean until this point, And then the concentration of the pollutant increases and then it decreases and in the rest of the river, it is clean again, okay? Zero concentration. So this is the initial condition. And now imagine that you want to transport this, okay? So the river has a certain velocity and it will transport this pollution downstream, okay? So if the river don't have any diffusion, it will move the pollutant only due to the velocity. Obviously, you can say, oh, okay, but real rivers do have diffusion. Yeah, but this is a model. So we can play with the diffusion in the model and we can cancel the diffusion in the model. If we delete the diffusion term, the model don't have, don't have any diffusion, you see? It's just transport due to advection. So it's just because of the velocity and not because of the diffusion. You can play and do it in the model. So what would be the result of doing it in, in a model without any diffusion? So the exact solution would be something like this. So the, the signal would propagate downstream without any change. And after a while, the pollutant would be here in this position and exactly with the same shape, okay? So this is the exact solution. But if you run a model without any diffusion, you don't get this. What you get is something like this. Okay, so we get something similar to this red curve, okay? Which is, it resembles the exact solution, but it has some diffusive behavior, you see? It's diffusing here. And remember, the model didn't have any diffusion, but even though, the result show some diffusion. Well, this is due to advective problems, problems in transport. You may try different way of discretizing the transport with a sophisticated uh, way of discretizing it, like the quickest is a method. Well, you see, it improves a little bit. It's closer to the exact solution, but it's not the exact solution. So one thing that we must 
bear in mind is that we will always have this problem. It's called numerical diffusion and we will always have it, okay? So you may think about these different methods, but if you look carefully in this method, you see negative values here. You see, this is one of the problems of quickest. You do this undershoot. So you get negative values. You say, okay, but it's small. Well, it's small, but it's a negative concentration. And there are no negative concentrations. Okay, so this imposes, a, it creates a problem in, in the solution. Okay, so we must be careful about this. So this is called numerical diffusion, this problem. The good news about this is that usually every process has diffusion and usually the numerical diffusion, so this problem can be masked by the real diffusion. So when we calibrate the model, we calibrate it taking into account that the model already has some numerical diffusion. And usually this is enough to, to, for the result not to be problematic. But sometimes don't, sometimes, especially in the vertical direction, when the system is stratified like the ocean, we must be careful not to have too much numerical diffusion. Otherwise it will completely destroy the stratification of the, of the system, okay? So let's try to understand why this happens. So this is the problem. Why does this happen? This is very easy to understand why it happens. So let's think about an even simpler problem. Let's think that this is our channel, okay? Downstream here. And let's think that the initial condition is we have a, pollut a pollution concentration of one in this first cell and all the other cells downstream have zero pollution, okay? And let's assume the current number is one. So now you, you already know what the current number means. So if the current number is one, it means that the property will move one cell in one delta T. So V delta T is equal to delta X. So it means that the property in one delta T will move from here to here, okay? So in time one, it will be here, okay? So this is the exact solution without diffusion, you see? Just advection. Okay, and then in time two, it will move from here to here, and in time three, from here to here. So if you draw all the results, you get this. In time one, it's here. In time two, it's here. In time three, it's here. And in time four, it's here, okay? And this is correct. This is the, the correct solution. So the model is behaving well and it's giving the correct solution. So, and I told you, if Kura is very high, it gets unstable. So if Kura is small, it should not have any problem. So let's put the Kura of 0 0.5. So if Kura is 0 0.5, definitely we will not have instability. So, but this is a different problem. This is not instability. This is numerical diffusion. So let's see what happens when CUDA is 0 0.5. When it's 0 0.5, it means that in one delta T, the pollutant only moves half a cell, you see? So the pollutant that in the initial case is here in the initial time, it will only move half a cell. It will not move to here, it will move like this, you see, it moves only half a cell. But this is a problem because as I told you, each cell is either zero or an, is a number, is a constant number. So it cannot be, we cannot have something in the middle, you see? We must supply the values to the cells and not to the middle between the cells. So the best this model can do is to divide this one of the, so the mass of the pollutant into two halves and put 0 0.5 in this cell and 0 0.5 in this cell. This is the best the model can do, okay? And then when we move another delta T, this 0 0.5 will move to the middle and it will be distributed between the two. And this one here will also move to the middle and will be distributed between the two. Okay, so a long time, we get this. 
So in the first time step, it do this. In the second time step, this one is distributed by these two. This one is distributed by these two, and so on. So after a few time steps, you get a distribution that resembles like a diffusion. You see, it's increasing until this point, and then it's decreasing again. The real solution is this. Okay, the exact solution is this. But the model, because of this problem of discretization, we cannot have the real solution, and we have a false diffusion, a numerical diffusion. Okay, so this is the reason for the numerical diffusion, and that's why we cannot solve this, this situation. Okay? Okay, so this was uh, a brief uh, uh, overview of problems in numerical models. Uh, after this, I would like to show you an example of what we are doing inside the Okazo project. One of the models that Okazo is a, is a project that uh, integrates information from different models and different observations into a coastal observatory. So Okazo means coastal observatory of the Southwest Iberia. And one of the models is the model SOMA. SOMA is the operational model for the coast of Algarve, which is being run in the University of Algarve. And this is what we are doing. So basically, we are, uh, we are integrating data from commands, from the Mercator uh, system, and also tied data from the FES model. We are using meteorological forcing from Skiron, and we are running the model in operational mode. And running in operational mode means that we run the model every day with the better conditions we have, to produce forecasts for the next days in the future. So this is what operational mode means. Okay, so we, we, we run the model, we store the results, we transform the results to supply to mobile apps, to web pages, and also to be fed to other applications like uh, beach water quality, oil spills, and so on. Okay, so this is what we are doing in the project. Uh, a few more details about this model. So we run two different levels, uh, nested levels, each one uh, with more than 1 million cells. So the first level is this level over here, which has a resolution of two kilometers in the horizontal direction. And the second level is this model over here that has also more than 1 million cells and has a resolution of one kilometer, okay? And the operationalization of this, so the method we use to operationalize is based on two, two cycles, a daily cycle and a weekly cycle. So in the daily cycle, we, we download data from different uh, forcings, both atmospheric and ocean forcings, okay? We certify the data, we create reports if the data is not okay. In that case, we have re redundancy. We can extract data from alternative sources to, to run the model uh, the same way. Okay, and we, when we have all these ready, we generate a simulation, we run the model, we quality control of the simulation, create another report, and then we store the data uh, we change formats, we populate remote databases. Uh, Enrique will show in a few minutes one of those uh, databases that we are using, okay? And because, so the, 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 the idea is every day we run the model producing forecasts for the next days. Okay, so in day one we produce this forecast, in day two we produce this, in day three this, and so on. And once in a while, in our case once a week, what we do is we need to restart the model to give initial conditions again, because the initial conditions start to deteriorate. So every week we start a new instance of the model. And when it's ready, we give the initial conditions for the new simulation. Okay, so this is what we do. And this is just uh, an example of a solution. This was produced in day 14, and is a forecast 
of the next layer. So now it's not forecast, but when we compute it, it was the forecast of the, the next days. And you can see we have the two models here, massive. So you can see there is a higher resolution model here and the lower resolution model for the rest of the area. Okay, and this is just a, a short example of what we can do with models. Uh, Enric, after me, will show you applications and uh, how you can access this data. Okay, so this was what I'd like to show you. Again, I uh, thank these two projects for supporting. And now uh, I will open a, a, a period of questions. So if any one of you have any question, raise your hand and the microphone will be given to you to answer the questions. Uh, I ask Maria to give the microphone to the first one. Hi, Juan. Hey, hey, Valdo Flavio, como vai você? Hi, Juan, everything okay? Everything okay, very nice to see you. Thank you. So it's a... Uh, it's kind of a, a out of curiosity. It's a, I have a, we are planning on applying a, a model. I, I don't want to say the name, but it, it appears to have some issues with resolving the title propagation. It's like some sort of, of numerical artifact that, that affects the, the way you, you measure the, the, the propagation character, like the, the, uh, the phase lag between the water level and the velocities. So uh -huh. I'm just wondering about if if you have uh, if you have found some issues in that regard, yeah. Or you have some uh, 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 I don't know advice to me in order to uh, to overcome that problem. Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> I would need more investigation than that. But uh, as a first guess, I could say that. It may be due to the to the to the bottom stress. So the uh -huh. the, the term, the bottom stress term. Uh, I don't know if it is a two D model or a three D model. If it's a two D model, this is more more drastic. Uh, the bottom stress controls the, the 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 velocity, the propagation velocity of the wave. So you should is one of the first par parameters you should use to calibrate the model. Another thing is the, the, the viscosity, the turbulent viscosity, but I would say the first parameter to, to move, to change, would be the bottom stress. Hmm. So, so, so now I see that's because we are trying to be fancy and, and including like the, the effects of many things in the bottom stress and, but but so maybe going easy, like slow and see what happens with only bottom stress, uh, a constant value, and then yeah. try to, yeah. to Usually see that's what I do. Usually uh, I start with a constant bottom stress. And I would say by practice that there, there are, uh, it's very rare that we manage to get better results by changing bottom stress, uh, rugosity. If you change okay. the rugosity, that it's, it's something that we, we are always uh, uh, kind of comply uh, to, to do of changing the bottom stress. There are fancy formulas based on <laughs> and so on. But uh, my, my experience is that most of the cases, they don't, they don't improve the model results. So please remember the bottom stress in, in the model is more a, a calibration parameter than other things. 
Okay, so okay, the simpler the better. But anyway, simpler. each case is a case. Okay, thank you, Blavio. Okay, you're welcome. Love. Yeah, any other? There is, there is a question here on chat. Oh, on chat. Uh, yeah. Do you want me to read for you? It seems you are using Mohit Studio. Why you have chosen Mohit from Islin Ghana? Uh, the question is why did I use Mohit? Why did yeah. I? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so this is. Uh, a bit of my bio, of my biography, because uh, I had the pleasure and the honor of being one of the developers of Mohit. So I, I collaborated in the creation of this version of Mohit, the finite volume uh, 3D version of Mohit. I had uh, the honor of being uh, part of the team. And after that, so. That's why I mainly use Mohid in all my, my applications. I don't know if I answered the question. Uh, there are more questions on chat. Can yeah, you? I mean, uh, <laughs> in, in our instructions, I was uh, <laughs> predicting this. <laughs> I didn't use a model, but I was predicting this. So let's ask people uh, to, to ask questions with voice, otherwise it's a mess. So those that are trying to make questions, please raise your hand and Maria will give the microphone for you to, to ask. No one with voice questions? Yeah, hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, good, good, good evening for you. Or good morning. I don't know if it's good morning yeah. or good evening. I have, a same, I have a small question. Hello, I'm Mashankar from. Hello. Hello, yes, I'm listening. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have a small question. When you speak of uh, operational oceanography, generally it needs a coupling of uh, different type of models. Because when you are giving operational product, it includes forcing from atmosphere, ocean, and uh, the you know air sea interaction. So you need uh, a lot of coupling between these uh, models, yeah. and also you have to synchronize the timing and uh, all these things. So mm -hmm. what are the methodology strategy strategy that, that you are adapting for operational oceanography of this kind of study? Yeah, uh, we, so we we. We use forecasts. So our forcings yes. are also forecasts. So what we need to synchronize is the, the beginning of each simulation, each, each day, should be after the, 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 the other providers give us the forecast. And then we set, set up all the model with forecasts of boundary conditions, forecasts of atmospheric forcing, and with all those forecasts, we can start the model, but obviously our model synchronizes all the, all the, all the forcing based on the date, on the simulation date. So whatever uh, the resolution or whatever the strategy that you are determining for your model, what is the spin-up time it takes for coastal region? Oh, for, for our, uh, this example of the SOMA model, yes. the, the spin-up time is, uh, total four days, if I'm not wrong, total okay. four days in total. We have different, the spin-up is not a, a single simulation. We have different phases of spin-up, but the total is about four days. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Another question, Aaron Estevez. Hello. Uh, Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, it was very good. And my question is that, have you ever tried to modulate a microfilm with the difficulty, not only by the diffusion, but the life of the time life of microorganism with the input of a satellite image? 
Uh, I'm not sure if I understood your question. So you are trying about talking about simulating the transport of microorganisms and comparing yeah. it with satellite images. Is it? Uh, yeah. 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 So uh, uh, personally, in our group, we are involved in uh, simulation of uh, uh, wastewaters. So it's something that we do very often. Um, and yes, we use Lagrangian models for that. Um, we, we never try to compare with microorganisms because we, we do it in a very uh, small areas, coastal areas, and uh, micro uh, uh, fecal coliforms are not easy to, to be detected by satellite images. So probably you were talking about uh, phytoplankton and things like that. So in that case, uh, I, we also simulated in that case with a primary production model of the Eulerian type, not the Lagrangian type. And no, we, we never compared it with satellite images, but we, we did many times that, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So more questions, there is Cameron. Hello. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, firstly, let me uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question is, uh, as you know, many, many, many uh, type models uh, when uh, we develop a model uh, for uh, for type, and it's uh, they, based it, it is based on uh, the calibration is based on the type case that uses yes. uh, yes. and uh, there is very very uh, uh, limited uh, uh, data about uh, tidal currents. Uh, uh, what I want exactly to know is that uh, uh, how reliable is a model uh, that is calibrated with a uh, tight tidal case? And how, how reliable is current velocity in that model? Oh, I see. So uh, uh, if I understood well, you are saying that you just have uh, water levels. You have tight gauges with water levels, and you don't yes. have any information on velocity. And you are wondering how reliable are the velocities obtained? Well, that's a tricky question. It depends on the system. In some systems, it's OK. In other systems. So you see, the, the, the tidal level is a, a variable that integrates what is happening along depth. So if it is a a, tree, a system that is stratified, almost for sure, for the same water level, there are many possibilities of velocity distribution in the vertical direction. Okay? On the other hand, if it is a well uh, mixed uh, system, uh, the chances for the velocities to be correct are uh, larger, even though uh, there are uh, different possibilities of velocity giving the same water level. So definitely you should try to have at least one or two measurements of velocities to be sure the calibration would be correct. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is the best I can say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. Hello, can I ask another question, please? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about that uh, quickest method, when we apply quickest method over other methods, uh, it gives some negative values. Yeah. This kind of model uh, solution, why it goes to negative values? Oh, I would need to get into details. So that, that was happening with the quickest. And the, yes. quickest, the quickest is, is a way of computing the, the, the advection based on a, on a polynomial, you see? So basically, uh, when you compute the, flu the flux, 
the advective flux into a cell, you compute it based on the point, the value in the point of the cell, the value upstream in the next cell, and the value of the other cell upstream. So you use three points. From this three point, you interpolate a polynomial. And with that polynomial, you integrate the polynomial to compute a long time the, the, the flux that is entering the cell. And because it uses a polynomial, so the polynomial uh, is not correct. And it has undershoots and overshoots, and that's why it happened. Is it applicable to fluxes only or uh, all kind of? Because yeah, it's applicable to the advective term. Whenever we are using the definite uh, differential equations, yeah, and we are defining both uh, lower limit and upper limit. Sorry? When we limit, define both the limits, upper and lower limits, for any computation. I'm sorry, I couldn't understand. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, I understood. Thank you. No, okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, uh, in the course of, uh, I, I really appreciate your presentation. It's oh, nice. Oh, oh. Thanks, Tom. Oh, oh. Thank you. 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 Yeah, Sunday. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Can I can I continue now? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. In the course of uh, uh let, let me first of all I appreciate the good work. You've you've done best. I like your presentation, Tom Bob. And uh my question is this in the course of you carrying out your work and uh, what and what road. I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm, I'm having problems listening to you. Can you please repeat the question? Okay, okay. My question is this. Uh, in the course of data collection on the field, do you usually involve surveyors? And what and what role the surveyors played in data collection? Hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand you are asking something about data collection. Hi, ladies. Can you please repeat it? No, what I mean is this. Let me repeat my question again. Yeah. You, you collect data from the field. Am I right? Yeah. Do you involve surveyors, hydrographers, you know, hydrographic surveyors in the course of data collection? Yes. Do you? And oh, what and what would they play because of the data is. collection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yes, it depends on the project. It depends on the situation. In this case, in the Ocaso project, uh, what, uh, we have two, two uh, institutes that are responsible for the, for the data collection. One is the Hydrographic Institute of Portugal. The, the other one is Puerto del Estado. And we, we also have the Institute, the Spanish Oceanographic Institute. So we have three institutes which are responsible for data collection. Yes. And Enrique, after me, will show some data, data measurements and an interface that you can use to see the data, the data uh, collections. Yeah. Okay, I, I would like to. I would like to have a. I would like to have a view of the interface of data collection. You would like to. Uh, you said the interface of data collection is available. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, next okay, can, can next you... presentation will be about that. Okay, okay, that's good. That's good. Okay. Like, thank you very much. Thank okay, you. Okay, you're much. welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so, we have three more minutes. There is any other question? Uh, hello, are you here? Yeah. Uh, okay, I have uh, two questions. Uh, you talk about you have uh, control uh, simulation quality. Mm -hmm. It's okay, okay. Yeah. I, I, I would like to know uh, how often or how you do this control quality of the model. Yeah. And another question is, uh, you say you have, you. Uh, uh, restart your model every week. 
Yeah. Uh, I would like to know why every week now, uh, why um, maybe three weeks or one month, why every week? Okay, so uh, first question is, so this is a, um, a project under development. So one of the things we are going to do is to use um, a software that was developed by Puertas del Estado called Narval. I don't know if you have heard of it. So a Narval has, is specifically designed to uh, analyze model results, to compare model results with measurements. So that Narval tool will be used uh, when this project is, is completed. Uh, at the present time, we do just a very basic uh, uh, confirmation of, of uh, results, you see? We see if the results are, were produced, we analyze uh, average values, but we don't compare it with, uh, with, the, with the measurements yet. So the objective is by the end of the project, we will be using Narval to calibrate all these, these results. Okay, so I, I hope I answered the first question. Mm -hmm. So the second question uh, is a good question. And obviously we reach this one week is a compromise between uh, model, model uh, computational cost and model results. So we did many simulations, many attempts and we reach for this system, for the cost of Algar, we reach to this one week uh, in, in a different system. It may be a different value. It depends on the dynamics of the system and so on. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so uh, I, I guess we are, we, we, we did these 15 minutes of questions and now I will pass the word to Enrique, uh, which will be presenting the, the work from Puertas del Estado. So I ask Maria, please, to give the speech to him. Hello, do you hear me now? Hello, Flavio. Okay, great. So, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to, to thank uh, Flavio for the opportunity of being here. It's, it's a very exciting audience from what I can see. It's audience from all around the world, which is very exciting, very, very nice uh, opportunity to explain what we are uh, doing here with respect to operational oceanography. We have a very uh, a large number of people attending. I hope that by the end of my presentation, the number has not diminished drastically. That will be a very good uh, success. So um, I will start now sharing uh, my screen and explaining uh, a little bit to you what we are doing in the field of operational oceanography. So, this is a, an index uh, why I work for the ports of Spain. I will explain briefly why ports need operational oceanography and why the society needs operational oceanography. I will talk about uh, oceanographic networks, how to measure in the sea to the service of the port and of the service of the, to the service of the society. I will talk uh, about forecasts in this sense, the previous presentation from a uh, previous speaker is perfect to, to frame my uh, presentation now. I will uh, highlight how this information is used in climate studies, and then uh, I will make a special focus on how we distribute the information, the web pages, the dissemination mechanisms, the alert uh, protocols, etc. Uh, we'll give you some specific examples for the port scales and uh, finish with some conclusions of the presentation. So we're starting. Puertos del Estado, my institution, why Puertos del Estado is involved in that? First, you have to consider that in Spain, 85% uh, of the imports and 60% of the exports are done via the ports. So these ports are vital for the national economy. 
There is an institution, which is Puertos del Estado, which coordinates uh, this port system, the main ports of Spain, a total of 46 ports, providing these large figures, these large numbers about the imports and exports of uh, the economy in Spain. So in our institution, we are, let's say, coordinating the efforts of these main large ports of, at Spain. So what about the marine physics on, on daily life? Why this is important? You can see here on this animation, uh, overtopping during a storm in the Mediterranean Sea. This is not a tsunami, it's, it's a normal storm in the, well, not a large storm, obviously, on the Mediterranean Sea. And this day, for, uh, there was three casualties on, on the Mediterranean side of Spain due to events like this. We have in the Spanish coast, high seas, important uh, tides with surges, high frequency oscillations like meteor tsunamis. Also, we have real tsunamis, long waves. We have important winds and currents in our, in our area is the Straits of Gibraltar, which is one of the most fascinating areas in the world for doing uh, oceanography. And we have there very, very important currents. And all these phenomena are of a uh, really importance are uh, relevant for several socioeconomic sectors, like fisheries, like search and rescue, like tourists, marine safety, and many others. I could say uh, energy, uh, biology, many, many sectors. We need to know all these phenomena. We need to forecast all these phenomena. We need to measure all these in order to properly manage all these sectors. Being more specific for the ports, we need this information for all the phases of the life of the port. We need a Medocean information for the design phase. When we need to build a port, we need to know the age of the waves that will be affecting the port. So we need to have a good climatological description. In this sense, Siemens Copernicus reanalysis and, and in situ products are very uh, useful to this goal. Also during the construction phase, you, you see here a picture of a port being constructed and you can see that people is exposed during the construction to the elements and they, they need to be sheltered on some occasion. When a storm is coming, these people need to go inland to avoid accidents. If you don't have an alert system, you can have casualties. And we have examples of, uh, of, of having that in Spain when these systems were not uh, ready yet. And finally, when the port is finished, it's used every day on the exploitation phase, on the operations. For example, the ports need to be closed sometimes when there is a big storm. And uh, if you look into the figures that I told you before, you can imagine the impact that closing the ports does have on the economy, the economy on the ports and on the economy of the country. So it's very important to close the ports when needed, but not before needed or after it's needed. It's important for the piloting operation, for the environmental management, for everything inside the port, you need to know what is the physical environment. For the crane operation, the wind is very important. Many, many examples. This, this product, there are many people in the ports that every day, the first thing they do, I don't know if before the coffee or after the coffee, they check into our systems and have a look how it's going to be the day they have ahead. If they are going to have waves, if they are going to have winds, if they are going to have any problem that will manage their operations. So operational oceanography comes to the rescue of uh, when you have this kind of problems. And everywhere around the world, uh, operational oceanography has the same pillars the same structure. Then, first of all, you need real-time networks. You need to measure what is happening on the, on the environment. You have tight gauges, you have buoys, you have HF radars, all this instrumentation. You will see that Puerto del Estado, you will see later on, have a very large network of instrumentation around the uh, Spanish waters. Then you have the models. You know everything about the models after previous talk. And you, the models are very important for the forecast to know what is going to happen a few days into the future. 
obviously the real time networks that does not measure into the future and you need to know what is going to happen in the next days once you start uh, measuring and you start forecasting and you start with your modeling activity you generate a, a lot of information if you compile this information you start creating climate information that can be later provided to users uh, in uh, to do all kind of uh, designs to do climate change studies to do many many things and finally everything is sustained by a uh, applications of downstream and outreach, the web pages, the alert system, the uh, models for oil spill, the models for search and rescue, all kind of application and tools that need to exploit the data generated by the previous system and convert it into useful information for the, for the final users. So these are the pillars and maybe this is, this is if you are a beginner on this world, Maybe this is the single most important slide on my presentation because it, it gives you how it looks like in every operational oceanography system around the world. All of them are working more or less the same in this way, with more or less, with better or worse real-time network, better or worse forecast system, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, the scheme, it tends to be this one. So in terms of a uh, spatial scale, it's very important to understand, uh, it was outlined by Flavio on, on its presentation, that you cannot solve everything on the same scale at the same time. You cannot solve the whole uh, world ocean at meters scale of resolution. There is no computer able to do that if you are doing numerical model. You cannot, there is no institution rich enough to uh, monitor the whole uh, world from your port or your uh, in installation that you need to monitor to the whole planet. So you need to work on different scales. You, you start working in our case on the regional scale. Regional means here, for example, the East Atlantic. This is the, the area where we have been working for decades now. Uh, so that's why I call it the classic Portos del Estado system. You have the measuring networks the Copernicus models and the Puerto del Estado models uh, working on the regional scale. Then you need to, as Flavio explained it in the previous conversation, downscale this, get, get closer to the coast and get inside the port uh, to solve your specific needs. And for doing that, we have a project called Samoa. It's uh, just by chance very, very familiar to the, to the uh, name of the model developed by Algarve, it's Samoa in this case. Uh, and here we have high resolution system. We have nested waves, circulation, sea level, sea surface temperature. We zoom into these large regional scale models and we generate high resolution solution. And finally, and equally important, this, these two previous uh, steps are generating uh, data and we need information. We need the tools, the downstream tools, to convert this uh, data into visual information and numerical information that provides, is, is useful to provide advice to the decision makers. Then we have a software which is called CMA. It's, it's standing in Spanish for environmental framework software. Uh, and this provides alert system, reporting, oil spill modeling, air pollution modeling, many different tools that is are being used directly by the port management in the decision making every day. You will see figures of all this. In the port, the users are all the port community, uh, pilots, environment, uh, env environmentalists, uh, responsible of operations, construction, etc. as I explained it uh, previously. But please, you can delete port here and put any societal sector of the ones I mentioned before. And in, in fact, in Portos del Estado, together with other institutions like Spain, we are serving all these other socioeconomic sectors. So let's go, let's start from the beginning. The beginning is going to the uh, ocean and start measuring. Uh, modeling alone will not solve your problem. You have to go there, you have to go to the field, and you have to measure to see what is happening in the field. Puertos del Estado has this, you can see here in a single map, 
Every dot here means a buoy or means a tight gauge or means a HF radar. We have one of the largest networks in the world, 25 buoys, 39 tight gauges, 20 meter station and eight HF radars. And we are also obtaining now additional data via Copernicus in situ tag, which uh, well, it's, it's a system, European system to provide information about the ocean. You will have a presentation on Copernicus tomorrow that I recommend. Let's go component by component now. This is the what we call the deep water buoy network. You see the stations on the, on the map. It's 15 stations. Uh, all of them, step one, uh, is, are from Puerto del Estado. The, the other buoy is from Instituto Español de Oceanografía. We have an agreement uh, with them to, to share everything and to create a single network. Uh, the depths where these buoys are located are larger than 400 meters. We put these uh, buoys there in order that they measure weights unaffected by bathymetry. So uh, the measurement of each uh, buoy is representative of a large portion of the coast. In this way, we can monitor waves all along the Spanish coast with a relatively low number of buoys. 15 is pretty large, but it's relatively low compared with the uh, differences and the different environments we have uh, at Spain. These buoys are multiparametric. Multi -parametric. We can measure waves, sea surface temperature, current, salinity, wind, air pressure. Many, many variables are being measured at the, by these waves, on, uh, by these buoys in real time. And the data has been transmitted into our uh, offices uh, at Madrid, at Spain, in real time. And directly, this is posted on real time into the web page, freely available for all the users. The good thing about this network is uh, that as we grow older, as myself and all my team grows older, the buoys are still in position. And, uh, it's now 20 years of time series in, in most of the position, which is a quite unique data set of some variables. So we, we are proud to have, for example, a current meter time series of 20 years, which is quite unique in all these positions. This is how this long time series look, looks like. Typically 15, 20 years, high quality data all around the Spanish water. This is obviously a treasure when you're going to study climate change and you're going to characterize the waters around uh, Spain. And it's been used by the whole uh, scientific community in Spain to do their own science. So we have these buoys for so long in spite of the difficulties. Uh, it's difficult to maintain a network like that. And I will not uh, lie. I will say that it's difficult and expensive because you have accidents, you have, a, for example, a unwanted interaction with fishermen. They are doing the work and accidentally they, uh, the nets are uh, yeah, around the buoys and you have all these accidents that you can see in the pictures. Also, you have a lot of biofouling. Animals tend to grow in what you see on the right is a current meter after four months of operation in the Canary Islands, you can imagine that this current meter is not longer a useful uh, kit, a useful uh, sensor. And this is the real life of the system, all kinds of accidents, all kinds of troubles, but uh, we work to have it. We and the companies working with us work uh, to have this operational and we are successful in doing that. Look uh, again, some images on how the buoys get out of the water. Let's go for another network. This is the so-called coastal network. We have in this occasion 10 stations. In the past, there were much more of these buoys in Spain. We, we, we reached in the past 22 buoys, but since we deployed the deep water network, these buoys became less and less necessary and we reduced cost by uh, eliminating some of these buoys that are being substituted by the more suited uh, deep water uh, buoys. We have here 10, 10 stations. Uh, they are measuring basically a waves and sea surface temperature. And they are typically the buoy of the port. They are close to the entrance of the port 
and uh, some ports are really dependent on the measurements of these equipments. I honestly believe that it's more a cultural or traditional uh, reason than, than really a real need of having the, the measurements so close to the entrance of the ports. Many of the ports have adapted to, to work with the a deep water network and uh, used uh, wave propagation models uh, to transfer the information from the deep propagation network to the to the uh, port entrance. Nevertheless, it's very useful sometimes to have some degree of redundancy. Having a big storm is a very important event and it's very important to record it properly. And it happens sometimes that for one or other reason, the deep water buoy network is one buoy is on maintenance or is broken for any reason. And we have this uh, network as a backup and providing uh, sometimes extremely useful information. The Red Mar tide gauge network, we have 39 stations around the uh, Iberian Peninsula. I think that uh, two months ago we installed uh, our number 40. So this is a little bit obsolete already. And this equipment is, uh, was uh, renovated a few years ago. And now those tight gauges are able to measure at very high frequency, two hertz frequency, like the buoys. So in fact, we are able to measure not only sea level in the traditional sense, but also let's call it buoys inside the port, what we call agitation inside the port. These are connected uh, via internet and we are uh, receiving every minute the data of these systems and posting that into the, into the internet. This is what I explained it before. Uh, this is the uh, uh, period in seconds of the energy of the sea level oscillation. This, this is a graph of the energy of the sea level. And you can see that there are two peaks on the right, which correspond to the tides 12 hours and 24 hours. The traditional tide catches was able to measure all that because they measure one data every five minutes or every minute in the best case. But now we are measuring every twice per second. We are measuring twice per second. That means we, we measure everything. So it's very exciting now because in the last year, it's like uh, they drop a veil from out of our eyes and we are watching the real behavior of the sea at every, at all the frequencies. And we are understanding much better process like inundation of the coast by analyzing what is happening on the high frequency. And we were missing that signal before. This is, this is brand uh, quite, uh, quite exciting and new uh, discoveries we are doing with, with this new data. Sea level, as you know, is linked to all kinds of risk to agitation inside the board. You see here how the boats move with sedges and tsunamis, with the storm surge, and also with the sea level uh, rise due to climate change. With our network, we are addressing, thanks to this two Earths measurement, we are addressing all these problems at the same time. This is how the uh, flow of data is coming with the two words coming very fast. And we are using that to analyze sages, to analyze what we call long wave, engineers call it long wave. Uh, we are using that for alerts and visualization for forecasts and for the climate, for all the ranges that was presented on the previous slide. This is uh, our last development. It's a new tool that is available for every port. It's a very big a little bit complex, I will not, I will not have the time to, to explain this one, but it shows a very detailed, it's, an, it's a tool for experts, to be honest. It's a tool that show you in very detail uh, all uh, the energy content of sea level. And it shows you, for example, this is in real time, uh, moving spectra, showing the frequencies where you have energies on the, on the sea. You, you see here a distribution of spect of energy and the different uh, bands of the sea level oscillation. And this is now available on real time for all the ports of Spain. So the experienced user is making very good use of this tool and it's very useful for understanding problems in operations. For example, the movements of the ships inside the ports 
are being analyzed thanks to this tool. Also, we use this uh, sea level data for the searches and tsunamis monitoring. You can see here an example of a tsunami that happened on the Mediterranean coast. The earthquake happens uh, here on the uh, Algerian coast, and after a while, the tsunami arrived to the Spanish waters, and we were able to measure it. And now we have connected, you know, that Spain, you can see here a map of the tsunami generation areas. You know that Spain is an area in the south of Spain and Portugal, we have this famous devastating tsunami of 1755. And it's an area prone uh, to uh, tsunamis. So what we have done is to link our uh, tide gates to the tsunami warning system at Spain the tight gauges here, and it's been used. I will not go through this all this detail in detail, but just check that, just understand that tight gauges are here integrated into the tsunami warning system for Spanish coastal waters. Obviously, if you are in a location and your tsunami, the, the tsunami is reaching this location, and you can measure that with your tight gauges, it's not going to be very useful for you because the tsunami has reached you, but it will be useful for other locations that are far away from the tsunami and like they can get a confirmation that something bad is happening with half an hour of advice, for example, thanks to this integration. Sorry. Oh, this, is, this is a new development we are transmitting by satellite and we, some of the station here, for example, at Huelva, we, we are doing things in order this station could survive a tsunami. We are uh, putting an antenna very high. We are using additional sensors to try to make sure that at least some of the stations could survive to a catastrophic tsunami and at least have the recording for the future, for the study of the tsunami in the future. Finally, this uh, can be used for a climate change studies. These are the long-term time series of our tight gauge network. So I stop a little bit more on the tight gauges, but understand that every single network that I explained it, uh, here to you, like this high frequency radar, could have a presentation by itself, could have their own uh, very nice things to be told. And this is the last uh, network I will talk about is the high frequency radar network. We have uh, four systems, some of them in collaboration with other institutions. One in collaboration, very close collaboration with Instituto Hidrográfico from Portugal. Our good friends from Hidrográfico of Portugal have some antennas and they share with us a network in the uh, Gulf of Cadiz. Finally, I will uh, leave the networks and go a little bit for the modeling, back to the modeling to explain the next uh, leg of our system, which is the modeling. I will try to go a little bit faster on this, on this part. Uh, traditionally in Portos del Estado, we have been doing modeling on this scale, on the regional scale. We work on the wave modeling on this scale, sea level, and more recently on the circulation. Uh, the circulation modeling, we are doing that in connection with Copernicus. And in fact, in Puerto del Estado, we are responsible of the Copernicus model for the Atlantic, uh, Eastern Atlantic, for the Eastern Atlantic. This is uh, what is called the EBMFC, EBS Iberian Biscay Island, a region coming from Ireland to the Canary Islands. And in this, we, we run these models the NEMO model, the PISTES model, and the WAM model. NEMO for circulation, PISTES for uh, biogeochemical, and WAM for waves. And with every model, we uh, do forecast and reanalysis. Some details that is maybe this is not the right audience, it's too technical for this audience. But just uh, yes, for example, take that. The model takes uh, 100 million of points and it needs 1,000 cores of computer. FESGA is the computer center at, at Galicia. And we are running this big monster every day using 1,000 cores of a supercomputer 
to, to be able to provide a solution in this area uh, with, uh, one, uh, with three kilometers resolution in the whole domain. I will put you an animation. I'm a little bit afraid of the, sorry, uh, of the music. Uh, let's check it out how it works uh, on the, uh, I think I can mute the music here. It's fine, great. I will mute it to make it more clear. So what you can see here is sea surface temperature as extracted from the model. All these uh, structures are the eddies or the oceanic eddies that make ocean circulation so difficult. If you look carefully and if the internet allows it, you can also see some flickering that is the day and night uh, cycle on the sea surface temperature, the heating and cooling of the uh, day and the night. And you can see all the very well-known uh, hydrographic features on the area, like the heat being uh, accumulated in the uh, eastern Bay of Biscay, all the eddies in this, in this area. And uh, you see how complex this uh, circulation can be and how difficult it can be to locate all these eddies on the, on the proper position. Some uh, other phenomena are uh, also very well described by the model, like the upwelling you can see here. I will stop it uh, here. The, the cold water in the uh, uh, western part of the Iberian Peninsula uh, due to the upwelling phenomena, uh, which is producing uh, the very delicious uh, fish that we have on, on Portugal and the north of Spain. This is a 3D cut of the model just to show you the vertical structure and to explain that this model is really 3D. Hmm? There's, a, there's a ref uh, line now, oh, thank you. Uh, Flavio was also talking for a second about a Narval tool. Narval is a near North Atlantic regional validation tool. And it's the, it's the tool that we are using initially for Copernicus, and now we are standing in collaboration with Flavio and with other friends to uh, validate all our models with every existing information around. You can see here uh, the sets that Armal is employing. Is basically, it's, we are using all the available information to compare with the, with the models and to validate the models. It's a extremely useful tool, and I can give you examples that uh, some mistakes we made on evolutions of the Copernicus system, very subtle mistakes that you launch the new version at the beginning, everything goes right. But after three months, you start three months, you start to see something strange going on. And uh, you are able to detect that you make a small mistake in the model. And you are only able to detect that thanks to a tool like this, that is checking every day how your model is behaving. This is the kind of comparison we are doing. On the left, you have model uh, versus satellite images of sea surface temperature. And on the right, you have validation works of currents versus HF radar currents. Once you have all this information from the models and from the buoys, you store this in a database and you have your extremely useful database for climate uh, studies. The Portos del Estado webpage, I will talk about that. We have around 8,000 users daily, it's, that's an average. And uh, one of the products we have there is this access to the database. And you go there and you have interactive tools to access the information. You can do analysis interactively. You can download reports like extreme analysis. And if this is not sufficient to you, you can request to us the raw data to do your own science. And we have around 400 raw data requests per year for science and engineer. And this is, a, this is somehow a large number because 400 is not a small number, but it's, it's, it's small at the same time because most of the engineers, most of the scientists can use directly all the information provided by the interactive tools that we have on the web page. So only if this fails, only if, uh, you don't find the right tool for you doing your analysis at our web page, you request for the raw data. And this is the 400 uh, raw data requests we have per year. We use all this information plus uh, some additional numerical modeling, uh, 
in terms of a, a scenario, a climate scenario modeling to do a climate projections and to understand what will be the evolution of the ocean in the next century. This is an example of where we have done a climate projection in the Mediterranean Sea. You can see how a, our forecast of temperature provides an increase, a significant increase of sea surface temperature in the Mediterranean for the next century. So once you have all this data, you need to distribute it properly so uh, people don't get uh, buried in a, a mountain of numbers. They need information. They don't need numbers. So that's why we have all our web pages. First one is uh, the Porto system. You can uh, see the address here, portus.puertos.es. And this is our main uh, tool in order to interact with the society. We have around 8,000 users daily to this uh, tool. Uh, everything here is updated in real time, all the instrumentation, the numerical models that are executed twice per day, all the outcome is, is there. To be honest, we are very satisfied and, and proud of this tool. It's, I think it's, it's a very good mixture of a historical real time and forecast information. In this sense, mixing all this information in a single place in a GIS interface, it's quite unique. Next is the small brother of uh, Portus, which is the IMAR app. It's a uh, application for Android, uh, application for iPhone. And uh, uh, it's the same information, but in a simplified way. It's oriented to location because you are supposed to, to be inter interested to location when you're working with a mobile device. And it's a complementary approach to the web. If you have a computer, I obviously recommend uh, the Portus better than this one. But this is very nice uh, when you are uh, on the field and you have your, your mobile phone and you want to know what is happening on the location where you are. Finally, we are collaborating with Flavio and with other friends from Portugal in Spain in this beautiful Ocaso project. And uh, we have developed ocaso.puertos.es, which is the web page for uh, showing all our data and all our models into Ocaso. Here you can see the results from the model explained by Flavio previously, the University of Algarve SOMA model in the Ocaso webpage. We are very proud of uh, having this collaboration with Flavio and being able to incorporate in the same interface our models, the models from, from uh, uh, University of Algarve and in the future other, other additional uh, uh, models. So finally, we are uh, downscaling all this to the port level, and we are doing that. I will go a little bit faster because my time I'm running out of time uh, through Samoa modeling. That is the final, the ultimate step in downscaling. What we are doing is taking all these regional scales, nested it into a coastal model, and nest after that into a port model, and we are solving many ports with the resolution of meters. That is exactly what the people inside of the ports need. This is some uh, examples on uh, how the way field, for example, looks like in our model at Barcelona. This is the mesh, the grid of the model, of the wave model at uh, Gijón with two meter resolution, huge resolution. This is the numerical model we are doing for circulation in several points, sorry, in several locations around Spain. We have all these coastal models around Spanish waters. And this is a more in detail example of how we solve a numerical model in Algeciras Bay, which is here in the Strait of Gibraltar. We have first a model and a series of, of models to reach the meters resolution. This is very well explained in, in this video. Uh, what you see here is we are starting from the Copernicus model, from the EB model uh, on the Iberian Biscay Island. Uh, this big monster I explained it to you running a three kilometer resolution. 
then in Portos del Estado, we nest uh, this coastal model, which is 200 meters resolution. And inside this 200 meter resolution, we have a third level of zoom when we have a model 50 meter resolution. That is the one that the ports need to solve their own problems like contamination, like mooring of buoys in the, ca in the canal of the entrance of the port, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The many problems they have, they can use this uh, system. And this uh, complex nested uh, system is running operationally and it's being executed uh, every day in order to provide a three-day forecast to the uh, port. Once this is done, we have a specific tool, visual tool for the port, for the port manager. Well, all this information is shown to the port manager and they can set up alert systems in this, in this uh, tool. They can uh, run uh, additional models like oil spill models. And uh, this is being employed and managed by the ports uh, in daily life. We are very, very happy on how this is working for the ports. We have today around 2,000 users into this uh, registered in the ports into this system. So this means that it's 2,000 people with responsibilities in the, in the ports and in the companies working on the ports also. The ports open this to the companies working on the ports. Uh, it means that it's having an impact on the daily life of the board. And in fact, I can say that it's actually saving lives because when there, there's a storm reaching the port, they use the alert system provided by these systems to uh, uh, evacuate people from certain areas and to uh, enlarge the, the safety uh, precautions on certain operations. So it's, it's becoming more and more important on the real life of the ports. This is how it looks like the alert system and the reports that we are uh, issuing every day for the, for the ports. So they are receiving every day SMS and email alerts. They can configure their own thresholds. They can select the point where they want to have the alerts and they receive automatically the alerts when they have an event coming that is uh, creating some risk into the operations. This is the oil spill model. And uh, this is basically all what I wanted to say in the allocated time. Uh, as conclusions, uh, monitoring and forecasting the sea environment is a need for harbor authorities and society in general. I was asked uh, to do an economic study once on why it is, it is good in economic terms to have system like this. And when I started to, to ask for the figures, I uh, understood that it's not a matter of being efficient economically, it's a matter of need. Uh, some people cannot do their, their very important work without these systems. Also, it's important in terms of economic return. I have a good example showing that uh, how to invest in these uh, instruments uh, is translated into uh, economic uh, return and economic benefits. Uh, also, it's important for safety. As I mentioned, uh, for example, during the works, you need to, to ensure that the safety of the workers uh, is, is properly managed. And the only way of doing that is through these kind of systems. And the society and the port system, in our case, it can only reach this knowledge thanks to operational oceanography, combining properly uh, in situ measurements, numerical modeling, and rich activities. And you, have, you see here these dots at the end of the sentence. And these dots means that science is behind all of this. You cannot do that without leading edge science, and you have to be on the leading edge science to do this properly. So all the support of all the system is leading edge sciences, advanced science, uh, advanced science to, to keep updated all the, all the system. And to do all this is the mission of our team at uh, Portos del Estado, the, the mission of the team. I'm glad to coordinate at uh, Portos del Estado. 
and we are not working together. We are working with many institutions in Spain and around Spain. Uh, University of Algarve is, is not in, in this one because those are the closer collaboration from Spain. Uh, but uh, it's uh, a new collaborator thanks to Ocaso project and we hope to participate with, with uh, University of Algarve, with Hidrográfico and with other friends from Portugal and all, and all around the world in, in many other projects because, well, the oceans does not understand about frontiers. So it's important that we uh, learn how to collaborate and in this, uh, I think we are doing a very nice exercise today with this uh, opportunity to talk with people all around the world and explain the work we are doing. So thank you very much. And if you have a, any question, I'm, I will be glad to, to reply. Okay. Thank, th thank you, Enrique, for all this. I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's connected. Thank you, Enrique for your very, very complete and very illustrative uh, presentation. Um, now it, it was perfect about time. So we have time for a few questions. Um, I'd like you to raise your hand. Sunday apparently have a question. So please, Maria, can you give the microphone to Sunday? Can I can I come on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, nice job, Fanju. You really uh, dealt with the topic very very well. I appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, my quest my question is this: You you made mention of a uh, high frequency radar in the course of your lecture. Uh, honestly speaking, I'm not informed on what that is used for. I would appreciate if you can uh, just uh, explain what and what data you gather with high frequency radar. That's the first question. The second question is that uh, how accurate is your alert systems to the society, to the port users and the rest? Can you, can you repeat the second question, please? How accurate? Okay, how accurate is your alert systems? You know, alert system that usually give to the port users, to the societies. Okay. How accurate is this? Do you okay. get? Okay, okay. So my f the first question is about HF radar. HF radar is, is the last kid on the block, is, is the last uh, network that we develop. And I have the feeling that we are still uh, learning how to use the, this data. Uh, this, this HF radar is measuring uh, 2D surface fields on surface. And it's been very useful, for example, to validate simulation models. I can give you an example. Uh, we developed a model at uh, one of these coastal models that we developed it was at the Canary Islands, at Las Palmas port. And we felt that there was something, let's say, funny with this model, that there was some, maybe some mistake. And we used the HF radar uh, of Plokan, uh, another institution in the, in the Canary Island, that they have an HF radar there, in order to validate our model. And in this case was to check that the, our model was not correct. And we, we needed to start uh, looking for mistakes and we found the bug and we solved the bug and now the validation with the HF radar is much better. So this is a good example on, on the use. And about the accuracy, it depends very much on what you are, what variable are you looking for. Some of the variables, it's like in, in atmospheric models. Some of the variables, the models are very uh, capable of uh, solving them properly. Uh, okay. uh, other variables are more difficult. It depends very much on the variable you want to 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 solve and on what. Let's say, for example, storm, storm. Well, in, in the storm, uh, is, uh, you have several phenomena working on uh, at the same time on the storm. Waves were very accurate. Waves, winds were accurate. Sea level, okay. we, are, we are very good also. Then, okay. for example, when we go into, into the currents at the open sea, travel starts usually. Uh, current at open sea are, are more difficult to, to, to forecast. 
but uh, in, in extreme events, things become uh, easier to simulate uh, typically. The problem is uh, during calm events. <laughs> during calm events, for example, circulation is very difficult. To, in open seas, circulation is very difficult because you need to uh, locate properly all these eddies that you saw on the figure on the animation and to locate exactly all these figures on the right position is very difficult. Mm, difficult. Is there no available uh, availability or possibilities of using uh, satellite-based method to solve that? Yeah, it's positioning it, it, of that it, now. It's it's a problem. It's a problem of data simulation. The, all all the models. It, it, we are we are going a little bit technical. I I want to give time to other people, but it's a problem to, of data simulation. Okay. Uh, basically, when you look into the atmosphere, you see that uh, atmospheric front is a uh, thousands of kilometers long usually it goes from, for, from spain to the uk and you have thousands of barometers in the ocean the fronts are very small they, they are 10 kilometers 20 kilometers large and you have basically no no data you have one satellite that passed uh, once per day on the area and uh, this is the problem the lack of data okay okay thank you thank you you're welcome Yes, hello. Hello. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, Slim Ghana from uh, Tunisia. Nice to meet. Nice to chat with uh, with you. I hope next time we'll be in person again. Okay. <laughs> so um, uh, as far as I know, so uh, harbor uh, manager are uh, so concerned by uh, wave motion near a coast and uh, inside harbors. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you please uh, tell us or tell me or uh, uh, what are the type of uh, model that you are uh, using in order to uh, so simulate uh, wave motion uh, near the coast and uh, inside harbors? Yeah. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, how so you 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 give the information to uh, to the vessel in order to help them in uh, in the navigation. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's go for the two. Uh, first of all, I like to um, highlight that. It's not only waves. In fact, we did a, a, a questionnaire a, a few years ago a, to understand what were the major problems inside the ports. And to, we were expecting waves to be the first one, to be honest. We were sure about that. But we were uh, surprised when we find out that it was wind, the, the worst problem for them. In many, many cases, for, for many different reasons, I cannot go into details, but for example, for, for the crane operations, it's very important. The, the wind can stop the port to operate. Okay, once I yeah. said that, uh, waves, we are using wave modeling in two stages. We use swam model uh, from the, let's say, deep water to the entrance of the port. And then yeah. we use a mild slope uh, model uh, for going inside the port. We use this mild slope uh, in a linear wave in order to reduce computation uh, cost. But uh, we are getting too technical here again. But uh, take that. Uh, SWAM and mile slope uh, in two nested uh, levels. And uh, uh, the other question, if one was about waves and the other one, sorry. So, uh, uh, so usually uh, um, uh, in order to, to simulate uh, uh, so wave motion uh, inside harbor, we, we, we use a uh, uh, so yeah. model. Yeah. So yeah. I would like to know uh, how do you uh, so couple the, 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 the SWAN model with the, with the Businesk model if you uh, use we, this we, kind of... We, we don't use Businesk, we use Mile Slope, which is uh, a model that you can only 
uh, solve uh, one wave component at a time. So what, oh, we yes. have, what we have is a library of monochromatic propagations, and yeah. we propagate the spectra by linear combination of the uh, individual monochromatic uh, uh, wave spectra propagations. Understood. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, so could you uh, so give the name of this uh, mid slope? Oh, uh, it, uh, I, 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 we use we use several several of them uh, along the time. In recent times, we are using one uh, by the Cantabria University. Developed by I don't know exactly the name. I, is it I, open source? I don't know. Sorry about that. Okay. But it should, you should uh, have no problem in finding a mild slope open source model. There should be no problem with that. Thank you very much. So the, the second part of my question uh, yeah, what was, it? was uh, about uh, how do you uh, so help uh, vessel captain? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, we are mainly helping uh, the port and uh, the piloting. And something we are additionally doing is transmitting uh, to the ships uh, the information on uh, meteorology and oceanography via the wave location system. I don't remember how is it called now. Mm -hmm. this, 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 this system that locates the position of each ship. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, ICE, ICE system, the I, I, AES yeah, system. Yeah. Uh, we transmit metocean information through this system also to the ships. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, um, my name is Teresa. I'm from the big wave city in Portugal, <laughs> Nazaré. Uh, I would like to ask you something. Uh, do you share this kind of inf information with um, with nautical schools, especially with the pilot pilot students? Well, uh, all our systems are open to the society, and they are used by all kind of uh, users uh, from uh, ordinary people being surf uh, to well. I, to companies uh, of divers, uh, everybody is making use of these systems in Spain. About companies, I know because I used to work in in one uh, cruise ship company. Uh, but about the schools, uh, that's uh, my question because sometimes uh, when I was studying a long time ago, <laughs> uh, we didn't have. Uh, too much information about it. Uh, so we had to learn uh, at sea. Well, there's there's something very, very, very strange about how, and you learn that with time, about how uh, your products are disseminated in, into the society. It's, it's very difficult to reach uh, everybody and to be known by everybody. So uh, we, we have been with this webpage uh, for many years now, and we have these very specific products on, on the ports, for example, and still sometimes we go to a port and they and they say, no, no, we use Winguru. And, and you Winguru, are blown, it's not yes. enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, you're, and, you're, and, you're, and you're blown away because you, you have a two meter resolution uh, model inside the port of this guy and he didn't hear about that because they didn't have the communication in, in the port or whatever. Yeah. And, and uh, they are still using WinGuru, which is nice. I have nothing against WinGuru, but there's no two meter yeah, resolution yeah, WinGuru inside the port. This is our job. And uh, what I want- And especially with, when the wind is the main problem. What I wanted, what I wanted to say with this is that uh, uh, once you create a product, it's amazingly slow uh, the implantation of this product. You, you are the proud creator of the product and you believe that everybody will learn about that. And it, no, mm -hmm. no, it, it does not happen like that. It takes ages for a product to be well known. Okay, I understand. But thank, thanks anyway for everything. <laughs> thank you. Pleasure. Hi. Uh, 
Hi, Enrique. Thank you for your presentation. It was amazing to see uh, the uh, great amount of work that Puerto del Estado is doing. And uh, you. most of all, the uh, open uh, attitude that you, that you have for uh, everyone else to use. Thank um, you. Regarding um, observation, just observation for your, for your models, I have uh, three questions, uh, probably simple questions. The first of all is uh, how do you do, um, uh, how do you manage to do real time data communication from the uh, offshore uh, observation stations? Uh, meaning, how much data are you transmitting and what means do you use to, to transmit that data? And um, the other two are a little bit connected. The question is, uh, it seems that most of your work is focused, uh, Puerto del Estado work is focused on uh, observation of surface uh, phenomena. Um, do you plan to, to, or do you somehow uh, uh, plan to, to observe the uh, water column and, uh, and uh, add to that new observation, uh, observation points? Okay, that's, that's a very good question, especially the second one. <laughs> uh, with respect to the first one, uh, we, we do, we, with the deep water uh, buoys, we do satellite communications. Every hour, the buoys send uh, uh, via OPCOM satellite constellation the data to, to Puerto del Estado. Uh, it's an expensive communication, so we try to be very uh, to send small packages of information. And also, the buoys have the capability of receiving uh, commands to change things. We rarely use this this capability, and basically, we only use when we have a, a malfunction on a buoy and we send a reset, trying to bring the buoy back to life. These kind of things, but it's not very very often used. Uh, the coastal buoys does communicate via radio, mm -hmm. and the rest of the instrumentation is in land, so they are uh, plugged into the internet without any problem. And uh, the second question, uh, we have done more in the past in the water column. Uh, we, we maintained uh, current meter lines in the past. These were uh, eliminated uh, during the uh, uh, crisis and up to now they have not returned it into into position because we needed for a while to save a lot of money and uh, they are not back into into position maybe something to 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 recover in the future and uh, as a first uh, step in that direction uh, we have uh, thanks to Ocaso project we have placed an ADCP in the Cadet buoy so we are now able to measure uh, currents uh, with this ADCP in the, in the water column. And uh, I think that will be an excellent thing to be done in all the network. Uh, obviously, the only problem is the cost. But it's something that in the future, uh, I think we have to, to try to, to achieve because it's, it's uh, we also, Carlos, we have to find an equilibrium between uh, what we want and what we can do on the long term. We have to be very, very pragmatic on what we are doing because I need to sell this um, activity to the next director of Puerto del Estado, to the next president that is coming, I don't know, every, from time to time. And everything has to be very rational and very, very linked to, to, to every. Uh, instrumentation has to be linked to, to uh, and very practical. And sometimes the uh, water column is a little bit more difficult to, to justify for us. So this is also why we are, why we have to be uh, step by step. I think this this uh, ADCP uh, in Cadiz is, a, is is the way forward. That's amazing. That's great. I'll, I'll just a, a small question. The ADCP is on the buoy, the the moored yeah. buoy we have, yeah. and yeah, it's, it's facing really down. Yeah, that's correct. Crazy. Okay, that's great. Now, well, good luck with that one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, uh, we, we are, we are, we are, uh, we experience a few problems, but I think it's it's fine now. It's 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 nice results. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you. Hello, uh, hello, Enrique. Uh, hello, uh, this is Paulo. Uh, I'm working at IPMA in Lisbon. Uh, great. 
very much for, for your presentation. It was uh, very, very useful, very interesting. And uh, I, would, I would like to you to comment on uh, the, if the meteorological forecasts are in somehow a bottleneck for the accuracy of the very, very high resolution uh, uh, ocean, oceanic models uh, in the ports. So if you see, I would like you to comment on that and how would you how would you how did you uh, recommend uh, how to not uh, having increasingly uh, um, challenging uh, meteorological and uh, oceanographic um, uh, models running uh, coupled for such short uh, so how do you see this, uh, this, this, this um, link between the meteorology and the scenography at very, just very, very, very small scales? Well, that's, that's quite a question. Uh, and I think, uh, once again, it depends uh, very much on the problem to be studied in the particular case and in the particular domain. In some occasions, I think that is uh, the benefit could be neglectable, and in some other occasion, the benefit could be huge. Uh, I think that, for example, working on, on the Algeciras Bay and the Strait of Gibraltar, having a very high resolution atmospheric model is going for sure to provide a better, for example, a better wave forecast inside Algeciras Bay. And in areas like that, in complex topography areas, I uh, am com and large enough areas. This combination of complex topography and enough fetch uh, will will uh, naturally create the conditions for um, important uh, improvement if you have a high resolution wind uh, in your model. So it's 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 a way forward. And in fact, in, into Samoa system, one of the things we are uh, working. I did not uh, mention that, but Samoa is a, a, the activity where we develop all these high resolution for the models, for the port, sorry. And uh, in Samoa too, we are uh, also doing high resolution uh, atmospheric modeling. It's, it's uh, under development now, Samoa too. So we are uh, trying to uh, downscale also the atmosphere in order to be sure that we are dealing with the right forcing at the right scale. Okay. Very, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, I, uh, I, I actually have one question. Due to the wind movement, it will affect uh, the accuracy of radar data and some other models based on the remote sensing data may I know how you are coming uh, overcome this uh, obstacle and thank you so much so, sorry I was not able to understand your question yeah my question it was about radar uh, data the accuracy okay. of radar data was used Okay, the HF radar data, you mean? Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the wind speed will affect the radar data accuracy. May I know how you are going to come over this obstacle? So you mean that the HF radar can be, the accuracy can be affected by problems? That's what you mean? By the wind, wind speed, yeah. Ah, the wind speed. Okay, for example, yeah. when, when there is no wind, you have we have no data. You mean that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, how you are going to come over this obstacle? Yeah. We have no, we have no way to come over this obstacle. Uh, basically, the HF radar data, uh, it's working fine most of the time, but in, in situation of extreme lack of wind, we have no proper, no, no good data, and there's no way to 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 sort it out. It's it's a it's a basic uh, limitation of the technology. You don't have mm. a, a small waves that are the way the ones that uh, use the radar to be reflected to reflect the wow. so so if you have zero wind you have no no good data and there's there's no way no no way to solve, to solve it, it. To solve yeah it. No, it's a limitation yeah. of the system okay thank you so much really appreciate it. thank you so much you're welcome thank you hello uh, 
Hi, I'm Umar Shankar from India. I'm working in a, a coastal research center. So I have two questions that you told about you have a, nearly 24 coastal models. They are, whether they're independently running out of, I mean, say, uh, whether they're nested into the regional model or they are independently running? No, no, they are, they, they are all nested into the Copernicus regional model, into the so-called EBMFC model, the one that I showed the animation. Okay. Uh, are there any water quality model related means uh, included in that? We are uh, running a biogeochemical model into the regional scale, uh, but we never worked into water quality inside the ports. Uh, the only thing uh, similar or related to that is that we are running oil spill models inside the ports, but not water quality. Okay. Another thing, uh, I think you have answered, uh, but I couldn't understand. You have uh, nearly 20 years of uh, high resolution uh, buoy network data. Uh, are you estimating this data on real time basis to the models and uh, coastal models also? Can you repeat the question, please? I was not able to understand. Uh, your buoy network data, are yes. you assimilating to the models? Oh, okay, assimilating. Okay, okay. Uh, no, they are not, they are not being assimilated. Uh, they could be assimilated and uh, maybe in the future they will be, but uh, they are working as uh, independent points for uh, validation. And in fact, uh, it's not clear that assimilating this small number of points will provide a large benefit on the, on the system. Furthermore, uh, it's good to have some points uh, not assimilated in order to have independent points for, for validation. But uh, obviously uh, they could be uh, assimilated and we have not opened this uh, line obviously because we cannot open every every single line that we would like to, to open. But it's a very good question. And um, my my best answer will be to, to tell you that we have done that in the past with this and this result. But this is not the case, except with the waves. With the waves we, we did uh, in a European research project uh, experiment of assimilating the waves into the models. And um, I think that the benefit was very marginal because the waves are too close to the coast to provide a, a, a very good uh, uh, outcome. Great, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your talk. Um, I am Theo Barakini from EPFL Switzerland. Um, I have a question. I apologize if you mentioned it already, but do you provide the uncertainties of your forecasts? That's a good one. <laughs> no, we, we, we don't, we don't uh, provide systematically the uncertainties of our forecast. We, it's, it's quite, quite a challenging thing to, to be done properly. Uh, we are doing uh, properly with, uh, for example, with a sea level forecast only. That, that's, it. that's the only one where I am really satisfied with the uncertainty accuracy. Why we are, we are I, I am satisfied with this, that, with this one, because we are doing some ensemble forecasting for that. And ensemble forecasting, which is basically means to run different uh, models or different or the same model with a slightly um, random variations, uh, uh, is the, is the only way to provide a, a nice a, a accuracy, real time accuracy estimation. If not, uh, what we are doing as a proxy of that is we are providing a validation of these models and the validation of these models can give you an estimate of the accuracy. 
what we are certainly doing, and you can check that on our web page, is all the models that we are providing, we are providing the real-time validation. And obviously, if you look into the, for example, into the last month of the validation, that can give you, even without being an expert, a good uh, proxy of the accuracy of the model. Right, I see. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, do you consider ensemble Kalman filtering for your um, overall uh, hydrodynamic model, or is it not in the plan yet? Well, this is being done in the regional scale modeling on the on the EBMFC model. It's been uh, is using an ensemble uh, Kalman filter for the for the data simulation. But uh, on the coastal uh, models and on the for, and of course on the port models, uh, we don't have uh, neither the experience and I think we don't have we don't have the right amount of data to, to assimilate. But since they are nested into the regional scale models, they are, they have the heritage of the data simulation of the uh, uh, regional model. So uh, do you remember that uh, in previous presentation, Flavio was mentioning that they were doing a restart every, every week. Right. And they are doing that to, uh, to get the heritage of the data simulation we are doing on the regional scaling. And we are doing similar things on our coastal models in order to make sure that uh, the uh, data simulation that is being done on the regional scale is moved, is, is translated into the regional scale models, into, sorry, into the coastal scale models. From the regional, on the regional we have data simulation. And through the next thing and tricks like this restart that Flavio explained it, we, trans we move this information into the coastal without the actual need of doing data simulation into the coastal. Um, I see, and um, maybe you mentioned already, but in, at the regional uh, scale or model, what do you assimilate? Is it remote sensing data or institute data or both? We, 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 we do both, I did not mention that because it's a little bit technical and we, we assimilate uh, altimeter data and we assimilate Argo data, these two sources of information, Argo drifters data. Okay, great, thank you very much. Hello? Yeah, hello, sir. Yeah, see, yeah, I, I, can, I can hear okay. you, go. Uh, I have a question about the modeling wave, current, or tidal in the equ in equator. Should us to use Coriolis parameter for the accuracy of the modeling? Is that important or might as ignore it? Because they're located in the middle of Earth. Yeah, I know, I know. In, in the in the middle of of Earth, uh, Coriolis force is uh, equal zero. But uh, my question is, if you are uh, uh, using uh, what what you have to do is to use standard models. Uh, standard models means that if you are going to use a circulation, you will use. Mohit, or you will use ROMS, or you will use NEMO, one of these models that are very well tested. As Flavio explained it, please do not go and use uh, new models. Also, avoid the, te the temptation of building your own model. Uh, use family community models, what is called community models. There are a few of them. And if you use one of them, uh, and if you're working with the, uh, at the equator, it will um, make basically no difference. Uh, so, uh, uh, because naturally uh, the model will compute uh, the Coriolis force as zero. So don't don't take the force of uh, canceling uh, the Coriolis force or just yes, the model will do it for you because you are in Ecuador. Okay, okay, thank you.
and he kept, he was the last one. Okay. Okay. So thank you to all of you. It was a pleasure to, to uh, talk to such a, a, a widespread audience. Uh, in, this, in this coronavirus time, it's, uh, we, we saw today a glimpse of the future, I think. All right. Uh, I would like to say thank you for all. Uh, and I hope to see you here tomorrow. And if you have any questions and concerns, let me know by email or message here. All right. Thank you, Enrique. See you tomorrow. Uh, thank you, everyone. So uh, I was supposed to thank you all. People are leaving now, but anyway, thank you so much for all the, the, the presentations and the questions. I would like to tell you a few things about tomorrow, so please don't leave the room. Uh, I ask Maria to give me my camera back, please. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, tomorrow we have another session. Uh, let me share the program with you. Okay, so tomorrow, I hope you see the program. Mm, I'm not sure if it is the right screen this one. So tomorrow we have two presentations from the Copernicus Marine, Marine Environment, Environment Monitoring System Service, the commands. So Carmelo San Marco and Corinne Derval, they will be giving a, a very uh, explanatory didactic uh, overview of the service and of the products that are available in the service. And so you will be able to learn how to use it, how to download the data and how to use the data. So uh, same as today, the time for the meeting is three o'clock uh, Portuguese time, which is four o'clock uh, Central European time. And you must do the computation for the rest of the world. So I hope to see you all here tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, we should have a coffee break, but it's impossible to have a coffee break. So I hope you go and drink some beers after this. Anyway, see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>